Yeah, welcome to nonlinear optics. Last but one lecture. And interestingly, we covered all the material I used to cover in the previous years. And this offers the opportunity to talk also about some new developments in nonlinear optics. And what I want to discuss today is extreme nonlinear optics, in particular high harmonic generation because this is a field that seems, to be, that seems to be very important, particularly also here in Jena. And I'm pretty sure, as I will explain, that there will be a Nobel Prize in the next uh, 10 years or so in this field. I hope at least. Okay, so extreme nonlinear optics, as you might guess, we will talk about fields that are considerably stronger than those that we used so far. We didn't really specify what we mean or which intensities that we would use in, in nonlinear optics so far. Well, we kind of did. At some point, I said that the intensity shouldn't exceed the damage threshold. So far, we always assumed that we have some, some nonlinear crystals, say, in most cases at least. And of course, such a nonlinear crystal can be very expensive and usually is quite expensive. And so we don't want to dis, uh, destroy it. Yeah, of course not. This is different actually in extreme nonlinear optics because there, at least the things that I will do today, there one uses just gas as nonlinear medium. And therefore, well, if you destroy it, then it is uh, quite easy to resplenish it, and so on and so forth. So let us look first at, well, at some kind of a, of a sketch. So the idea or the question is, take a strong laser. Well, in nowadays, yeah, uh, for nowadays, uh, technology 10 to the 15 for a femtosecond laser, it's not that strong. When I was a young student, uh, these fields were called super strong fields. Well, uh, times change. So, and what we do is that we shine with such a laser on, on some atoms. I explained already, usually this is just gas. Yeah? And then what we observe is, if this field is st um, strong enough, then we observe ionization, so the photoelectric effect. Although the photon energy is usually much smaller than the ionization energy. So if you think back to, um, to the photoelectric effect as discovered originally by Hertz and then worked out by Halvax and Lennart and, uh, and these people, there the paradigm was that the photon energy must exceed the ionization threshold in order to be able to ionize. Well, if you have strong enough fields, then you can absorb more photons than, yeah, so within the time energy uncertainty, then you, can abs then you uh, have the chance to, to hit with more photons than just one, the, um, the cross-section of the, um, of the atom, and accordingly, the atom may absorb, say, 10 photons at once. And 10 photons then could be enough to ionize an atom. So uh, a typical atom could be a rare gas atom because they have a fairly high ionization threshold. They are easy to work with, not poisonous, and things like that, right? So just convenient stuff. Um, and then if you take something like argon, if I remember correctly, it has an ionization threshold around 15 electron volts. Whereas if we take a typical laser, well, at least it used to be a typical laser, a titanium sapphire laser with a wavelength around 800 nanometers, then the photons, photons correspond to an energy of 1.55 electron volts. So this means if you take 10 of them, then you can, then you can um, 
then you are beyond the ionization threshold. And what happens is, of course, ionization. And if we have ionization, then we produce, of course, photoelectrons, and um, accordingly also ions. Uh, but the interesting point is that we can actually absorb more photons, much more photons than necessary for ionization. Yeah, so uh, people, when these kind of effects were discovered in, um, in 1979 for the first time, yeah, so that an atom absorbs more photons than necessary for ionization. They called it above threshold ionization, we still call it like that. It's, a, it's kind of a misnomer, uh, but uh, never mind, so it's just the name. So we can absorb much more photons, hundreds of photons more than necessary for ionization, and accordingly, one can produce quite <clears throat> uh, quite high energetic photoelectrons, if you're interested in those. Um, of course, it's also possible not only to ionize the atom, but also the ion can be ionized furthermore. And so if I can absorb 100 photons, then it's of course possible to also ionize um, the, the ion once, twice, and so on and so forth. Well. That's all very interesting, and in my group we are working on such things. But uh, there's another opportunity, or there's another process, namely the generation of, of harmonics, of high harmonics. We discussed already that we can produce, of course, the third harmonic, and you guess that it's also possible to generate the fifth harmonic, and certainly then there will also be the chance to see a few photons of the seventh harmonic. But what about the 101st harmonic? Now, the initial guess when these experiments were started was, of course, that, well, that, that there won't be any photons at such an, uh, a high order. Right? And you see that this is a if you remember what we, what we discussed as the origin or our mathematical approach to treat these processes, we did a power series expansion of the polarization. Now, think you would have to expand it to the 101st order. I can tell you that this is not possible and also not sensible um, because of reasons that I'm going to show in, yeah, in this lecture, actually. Okay, so the nice thing about strong field laser physics, how I like to call it, or extreme nonlinear optics, as you might want to call it, um, yeah, so we can look at three things here, and the nice thing is that uh, disregarding of what you, you are looking uh, at, you get an interesting effect. So let's first look at, at the electrons. I mentioned already, that we, can, um, that we can absorb more photons this, than necessary for ionization. So look at this graph, what it displays. So it, display, it displays the energy, the kinetic energy of these photoelectrons um, on the x-axis and the count rate on the y-axis. And we do it on a log scale, well, because as you might imagine, um, yeah, so if you have the power series uh, expansion, in, uh, if you remember that, if you have this in your mind, um, then this certainly makes sense to plot it on a log scale. Yeah, so you see here so something like four orders of magnitudes uh, of dynamic range or so, and uh, you see here now a series of peaks, right? And the first one, I think, I ionized at that time, what was it probably? I, I think it was argon, looking at these uh, spectra. Um, and you see that um, we absorbed uh, something like 10 photons here in order to cross the ionization threshold. But then it was also possible to absorb 11 photons, or 12 photons, or 13 photons, or 14 photons, and so on and so forth. Right? And for each photon more, you would get um, one of these peaks. Right? 
But this is not the really interesting thing here. What makes it really interesting, and uh, this was actually uh, this discovery of 1994 during my PhD thesis, what makes it really interesting is if you increase the intensity a bit more, say to 1 times 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter, then you suddenly see this, this shocking behavior, really shocking this behavior, because what you see is that, well, uh, we can count it, but uh, you see that it is as likely to absorb one photon more as one photon less. Right? And therefore, the entire paradigm of this power series expansion, namely that a higher order has less probability than a lower order, this breaks down here. Right? And, well, I said already that this kind of spectra, they are called above threshold ionization spectra or ATI spectra. And uh, this feature here uh, was called or got the name uh, the plateau because of its ap uh, uh, appearance. And if you would increase the intensity, then in principle this plateau gets longer and longer until a certain point where it cutoffs. Yeah? Okay, interesting physics behind that, but this won't be the, the thing for today. Um, another effect, so if we now look at the ions, then what we can do is, is to plot the number of ions, singly charged ions here and doubly charged ions here as a function of the intensity. And in this case, it's a double logarithmic plot, right? And therefore, if you take the slope, then if you believe in perturbation series or in this power series expansion, then if you have a slope of of two, then you would have a second order effect. If you have a slope of three, then you need three photons, right? Slope of four, five, and so on, right? And just by taking the slope here of this curve, um, you would easily determine or you could verify whether, whether you need as many photons as nominally necessary for um, for, for ionization. Well, of course, um, you see immediately that this uh, bends off here. This is not the interesting effect because um, it bends off just because of the fact that at some point ionization saturates, which just means that all the atoms are ionized and then it's clear. Yeah, so at this point, a noticeable fraction of uh, of the atoms in the focus are ionized, and therefore, well, uh, once it, I it is ionized, then of course increasing the intensity furthermore doesn't help much. Okay, well, actually this blue curve is not the interesting one. Um, the red curve is the interesting one, the doubly charged ions. And um, what's, what's normal is, is this part here. Yeah, so this fairly narrow intensity um, part here, or we could also, yeah, so let's say this one here. These are just two experiments made at different uh, wavelengths, so never mind. Um, so you see it's much steeper than this curve here, and, well, it's clear, if you ionize the ion, you need much more photons. Yeah? But the interesting point is this deviation towards lower intensity, right? So one sees much more than predicted by, by a simple-minded theory. So this was a discovery by Anne Lullier. This was her first uh, discovery um, in 1983, so almost 10 years before, um, before my discovery. Um, and finally, there's another feature which is at the center of interest for this lecture, namely if you look for the harmonics. Again, a paper where Anne Lullier um, contributed, so she was actually the last author on that paper as far as I remember. And you see a similar feature just discovered a few years before 
I discovered this plateau, which she gave the name plateau. And uh, to honor that, I also gave the ATI plateau the name plateau. Um, so what you see here are the harmonics. Yeah, so you see the third harmonic over here. Yeah, so this is what we were discussing so far. Then you see the fifth harmonic, the seventh harmonic, ninth harmonic, eleventh harmonic, third, fourteenth probably, fifteenth uh, uh, harmonic. Where's the thirteenth harmonic? It's missing apparently. But you see a similar behavior as the one um, that I described for um, for photoionization. Well, and this is of course, um, yeah. This is of course exciting, not only because of the physics, because, uh, but also because of applications. Yeah? So what you see here are harmonics, so this means that you have coherent UV, even ex-UV radiation, and you just produce it with a, well at that time not cheap, but nowadays a fairly, a fairly affordable laser. You know, a few hundred thousand euros nowadays, you can produce ample amounts of of harmonics, exceeding actually to much higher um, to much higher order, and therefore to shorter wavelengths. So remember, if we start here with the with the uh, with 800 nanometers, say, and we go on to the 40th harmonic, which is nowadays very easy, uh, you have a wavelength of coherent XUV radiation of 800 divided by 40, approximately, right, uh, gives 20 nanometers, which is really short wavelength radiation. And as I explained, you can also go to the, to the 100th harmonic. Well, not exactly to the 100th harmonic. You can go to the 9, 1990th and 101st harmonic. Why? You should be able to answer that. Well, because we are just shooting in gas, and gas, just a cloud of gas, has an inversion center, and therefore even, um, even parity harmonics are not allowed. Okay, so the efficiency of produ producing these harmonics is fairly low, 10 to the minus 6, perhaps 10 to the minus 4, perhaps 10 to the minus 7, so perhaps even a little bit more, depending on how you do the experiment. So therefore you could say, well, then why is it important? Well, 10 to the minus 6 is not, uh, is not really a low efficiency if you think about how cheap it is to produce visible photons, or relatively cheap to produce vis visible photons. Nowadays, it's possible to put, uh, produce a kilowatt of, of femtosecond laser power, right? And if you take then an efficiency of 10 to the minus six, you still have a milliwatt of, of XUV radiation. Okay, so this is very interesting. And here is Anne Lullier, and uh, as I said, I predict that one day I hope within the next 10 years uh, she'll receive the Nobel Prize for this discovery because these harmonics, meanwhile, have a lot of applications. Well, and she made a few other key contributions to the field anyway. Good. Let's take a few notes and, yeah, and write up a few things such that we have it, that you have it in your notebook. So, ch uh, chapter 17, extreme nonlinear optics, and we first will wrap up the experimental signatures, so these three things that I explained, and also the parameter regime. So, which kind of parameters do you need in order to observe these effects? So, um, first, the observation So at high field strengths, and we will define, we will have to define what we mean by high 
field strength, so what is high? At high field strength, we can observe we can observe processes of very high order. Now, which means processes that involve more than 10 or even 100 photons or so, right? Now, the experimental signatures If you're interested in, um, in electrons, then as I explained, we have the phenomenon of above threshold ionization, photoelectrons. Um, this leads to above threshold ionization. ATI for short, and what it means is that more photons than necessary for ionization are absorbed. More photons than, yeah, it would have been nice to write this a little bit, in a little bit different way, so that we also have some space for a, for a figure. So above threshold ionization, ATI, more photons than necessary for ionization are absorbed. So in our sketch, um, following thing, um, yeah. See, we have the ground state of the atom here, right? I indicated was this ket, and we have the ionization threshold, say here. I call it just IP ionization potential, and then um, we need here. In this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight photons to ionize. And now if I absorb nine or 10 or 11 or so, then we call this above threshold ionization. And ATI was discovered in 1979 and this peculiar non-perturbative behavior, this plateau, um, yeah, 15 years later or so. Yeah. So Agostini, uh, Agostini and co-workers, yeah, so a famous name in the field, discovered that Agostini in 1979 and myself 15 years later. Okay, well, the next one is non-sequential double ionization. Yeah, so if you look for the ions, in particularly multi, uh, multiple church, uh, uh, charged ions, then um, one observes the effect of non-sequential double or even multiple ionization now why is it called like that well the idea is that if you expose atoms to such a strong field then the simplest process that you can think of would be that you first ionize the atom and then this the ad, uh, then the ion that you have created would relax to its ground state, and then you would start 
from scratch with this iron and ionize this one. And perhaps um, you would then even ionize the iron and then you would get, uh, well, even higher charge states. Okay, yeah, so uh, sequential ionization where you assume that you ionize atom, iron, doubly charged iron, and so on, each from its ground state. Right? And then, of course, the idea is, well, if you're quick enough, then maybe it's possible to do it before the atom relaxes to its ground state, or maybe something different happens, some process yet to be discovered or described um, can, can contribute. So, well, um, so next thing, photons. There we have high harmonic generation. People refer to it as HHG. And I just would like to, well, to make a, a sketch on how the experimental signature looks like. Once again, the experiment is in principle very simple because the only thing that you need is, of course, this laser. You focus it into a vacuum chamber in which you have a nozzle for, in order to put some gas into it. And then you put uh, an XUV spectrometer and just record the spectra, that's all. So um, we have here on the, on the X uh, scale, we have the frequency which we measure in units of the photon energy of the fundamental, right? So 155 electron volts if you use um, a femtosecond, uh, and a titanium femtosecond laser. Okay, then the spectrum, yeah, so, um, we have here on the, on the y-axis, we have the log, the logarithm of the photon numbers. Okay, and then we observe the third harmonic. This, the third harmonic, say the fifth harmonic, the seventh harmonic, the ninth harmonic, it goes down exponentially as one would expect from a perturbative behavior, but then suddenly it keeps more or less the same. Well, I say more or less, right, on a logarithmic scale, whatever this means, right? And this can extend to very high orders, yeah? but at some point it, it is over and we call this the cutoff. Yeah, so this here is the plateau. This here is the plateau. And this here is the high harmonic cutoff. And once again, we only observe, of course, the odd harmonics because of symmetry reasons. So I uh, hopefully I made it correctly. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So let's write that up. Properties of high harmonics. Properties of high harmonic spectra. So the first thing is only odd harmonics. Yeah, that's clear for us. Yeah, that's nothing new for us. Um, but then there are also other properties. So there's this peculiar shape of the spectra, which is, 
well, which was a which was a huge surprise to to physicists at that time, because they were all spoiled by by perturbation theory, atomic physics in particular. Yeah, so uh, you have to imagine uh, with the discovery of the laser, suddenly these multi photon processes became possible. Yeah, so the laser was discovered in the in the 60s, early 60s, and then after after 10 years, well, an entire zoo of nonlinear effects of multi-photon effects was discovered, and theorists um, were were trying to to describe them in all the details, and they were quite successful with that, based on perturbation theory. This happened in the 70s, and now 79. Uh, this guy at that time, young scientist, Pierre Agostini, came and discovered that's also possible to absorb one photon more. Well, still, uh, perturbation theory was kind of able to, to describe it, but when more and more ATI peaks appeared, in particular when this plateau was discovered, um, it was clear that perturbation theory is out, out of business. Right, and this used to be the the tool, the standard tool all the time. So one had to think in completely new, in a completely new way. Okay, so we have a peculiar shape. Of the spectra. That cry for an exp explanation. Yeah, so um, harmonic um, of order n plus two may be stronger than harmonic of order of order n. And of course also, what is the reason why this spectrum, this plateau extends to very high orders, but suddenly it cuts off. Also this calls for an explanation. And the final thing is the peculiar scaling with Lambda with the wavelengths, with the fundamental wavelengths, and with the intensity. So the peculiar scaling with lambda and intensity. So what I mean is the following. When you want to produce high harmonics and all the other strong, fields effects, uh, strong field effects that I, that I described, then, strangely enough, it is a good idea to start with longer wavelengths. It is easier to see very high or very short wavelengths of the harmonics if you use shorter wavelengths. Right? So harmonics actually were known before Anne So there was an experiment with the, the big laser uh, Asterix was its name, an iodine laser in, in Garching, where they also absorbed the fifth, seventh, ninth harmonic. And there was an experiment by uh, Charlie Rhodes, um, who observed even higher um, orders. He used, a, he used a, a UV laser as a fundamental. And unrelated did kind of the opposite. She used longer wavelengths and uh, discovered this, uh, this plateau very clearly. So there's this peculiar sh uh, scaling with, with lambda. Actually, it turns out that, that this cutoff, so where this yeah, harmonic spectrum kind of ends, that this scales with the inverse, no, this scales with lambda squared. 
right? So the, um, uh, the longer you make it, uh, the farther it extends out here. And it scales linearly with the intensity. Yeah? Interesting, isn't it? Um, OK. So let's also take this notes, note that nonlinear optics, as we yeah, discussed it so far, wouldn't be suitable in order to describe phenomena like high harmonic generation. So it is obvious um, that the power series expansion where we wrote the polarization here assuming instantaneous interaction, which is a pretty good approximation um, for rare gas atoms. Yeah, so where we have this linear term, then the nonlinear terms so that this power series expansion becomes questionable for processes of very high order. Actually, one can show, and it was known at that time already, that um, such a power series exp uh, expansion at some point won't converge. Yeah, so if you have very high orders, then such power, se power series expansions don't um, converge. So expansion becomes questionable for processes of yeah, very high or just high order. Because you also have to consider that there are cascaded processes where the, where the harmonics that you produce mix further say, with the fundamental frequency, and, and, so, uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So the entire concept uh, breaks down eventually because of lack of convergence. So you see, the traditional approach is really in, yeah, is really, has really a problem because of lack of convergence. Okay, well, so the next thing that we need to discuss is something that you probably hate. At least I hated it when I first was introduced to this field during my diploma thesis. Namely, what we use in, in strong field laser physics are atomic units, not the usual SI units. Um, I, uh, yeah. Uh, I didn't like this uh, uh, to the point where I decided, no, I do it in SI units. And then when I started to write a computer code in order to calculate these things, I soon was, was converted um, and, um, and learned to like atomic units. So atomic units, to, to put it colloquially, uh, these are the units in which atoms kind of live. Yeah? So at least the, the, the shell, the electronic shell of the atoms. They consist, as you all know, of electrons. And electrons are or can be characterized by two key parameters, namely their mass and their, their charge. So and what we do so if we measure things in, in terms of these two quantities, then we would say 
the mass is equal to one, right? So we take one unit, yeah, so as you would do with kilograms, so you take one kilogram piece after the other, and so we now measure in, in pieces of, of electron mass. So in units of 0 0.911, 10 to the minus 30 kilogram. This is our mass unit. Well, for charge, it's also clear. That's the unit of charge. And then there is a third quantity that is important in atomic physics, as you might imagine. Now, after all, we are talking about quantum mechanics. And so there is this fundamental constant in quantum mechanics, namely Planck's constant. And actually, when I say Planck's constant, I usually mean Planck's reduced or the reduced Planck's constant, which is the Planck constant divided by, by 2 and by pi, yeah, so h bar. So what we do is that we measure in units of the electron mass, in units of the, um, of the electron charge, and in units of the Planck constant. These three quantities are set um, to one. And then many formulas are much simpler. It's much easier to, to do all the calculations and, um, and, um, and estimates and characterize the parameters and so forth and, uh, and so on and so forth. So let's start with a new subchapter, namely 17.2. Atomic units. Yeah, so that's the natural system for atoms, particularly their electronic cloud. So uh, what we do is that we say that the mass is equal to um, the elementary charge equal to h bar, and this is equal to 1. Yeah. And an immediate consequence is, of course, that energy and circular frequency, that they have the same, the same units. Right? When I speak now of frequency, then I would say, uh, if I go quickly back to uh, to SI units. I would also measure frequency now in, in electron volts, yeah? because h bar is equal to 1. OK, so this is energy. Now, the atomic unit of energy is 27.211 electron volt, which is twice or which is two times the ionization threshold of hydrogen. As a, you may know from quantum mechanics that if you calculate the ionization threshold of hi hydrogen, then um, you see that it's just a combination of natural constants. It's just a combination of the mass of the electron, the charge of the electron, and h bar. And therefore, well, it turns out to be one-half um, the atomic unit. And if you go to higher charge states, so a, a nucleus uh, with a higher charge, then it's, again, even numbers. So um, the atomic it intensity that we introduced already, I think, in chapter one or two, the atomic intensity is a pretty high intensity namely 3.51 times 10 to the 16 watts per square centimeter. If you want to know um, a kind of, um, well, of an of a intuitive uh, thing, then think of the following. Uh, think of an electron that orbits the proton at the first Borean radius. So at a distance of 0 0.53, I think, um, angstroms, so 0 0.53 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, then, of course, it feels a certain field strength, electric field strength from the proton. 
And now you can convert this electric field strength to an intensity. Yeah, so just square it, the electric field strength, and divide it by two times the vacuum impedance, so two times 377 ohms. Then you find an intensity, and it's this intensity. Yeah, so this is the atomic unit of the intensity. Okay, well, now we have intensity, we have energy, and uh, you might imagine that there are, yeah, even more familiar and kind of fundamental um, quantities for which we need an atomic unit. Of course, a distance, and so the atomic unit of length is, of course, not a meter. Yeah, so the atom, an atom measures the distance in the radius of the Borean, of the first Borean orbit, as I mentioned or indicated already, right? And this is 0 0.53 angstroms. Uh, it's an, a unit that's not really allowed any longer, but because I'm also doing a little bit of X-ray physics, well, quite a bit, um, we still use it in X-ray physics crystallography. Yeah, so by definition. Okay, well, and now um, time, um, yeah, so um, time is not measured in seconds, as you might imagine. Yeah, so time passes much faster for an atom, so to say. So the unit um, of the time is something around 24 attoseconds, which is 24 times 10 to the minus 18 seconds. Yeah? So femtoseconds is 10 to the minus, minus 15, and attoseconds 10 to the minus 18. Um, yeah, and it takes an atom um, just something like 150 attoseconds to orbit the proton once. So 2 pi times this 25 attoseconds, this is this 150 attoseconds. Okay, so we measure in these quantities, and well, you should befriend yourself with uh, these uh, with these quantities. Good. So these were experiments, uh, the experimental signatures. Uh, I wrote here parameter regime. So let's discuss the parameter regime now. Okay, so typical parameter. Actually, I also prepared a few slides on that. Parameter regime of strong fields. No? Good. So I delete uh, this parameter regime over there. But, yeah, so let's look at a, at a typical pulse, a typical laser pulse like this, right? So um, we have time on the axis, right? We have the electric field, and uh, if you take a typical laser pulse, titanium, sapphire, yeah, so 25 femto femtoseconds, that's easily um, achievable. I said the photon energy is 100, uh, no, is 1.55 electron volts, which corresponds to an oscillation period of two and a half femtoseconds about, right? So this is kind of the, yeah, the time scale of, of, the, um, of the laser pulse. 25 femtoseconds, two and a half femtoseconds optical um, period. 
Now, if we go to the atom that we ionize, say, in the simplest case, hydrogen, atomic hydrogen, well, experimentally, not very simple because you would need to produce it first because you can't buy it in a, in a, in a bottle. If you buy hydrogen in a bottle, you always get H2. And this is a molecule which is much more complicated than, um, than an atom. There was a famous physicist, laser physicist, uh, physicist actually, Charlie Towns, I think, uh, was his name. And he said, said that a diatomic molecule is, is a molecule with one atom too many. Um, okay. Well, um, therefore, we mostly use rare gas um, atoms if we want to produce, yeah. Of course, molecules are uh, much more interesting uh, then because of their much richer. Yeah, so once one has understood the atoms, one should really go to molecules, which is what we currently do. Okay, now, um, so you have seen that uh, the time scale of, of the atom is much faster than the one of the, of the laser. You could even say that the laser, that the laser field also, it oscillates back and forth almost 10 to the 15 times per second, that this laser field is kind of quasi-static for the, for the atom. Uh, because the electron is even, is even faster. Yeah? And this is what you, well, this is not what you can see here. What you can see here is that we can easily produce field strengths that correspond to an intensity of 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter, really easily, right? And then if you, if you superimpose the atomic, the Coulomb potential with um, this static or quasi-static field, um, then, you can, then you can arrive at a situation where you suppress this potential barrier all together, even for an atom that's in the ground state. Right? And you see that there's no potential barrier any longer that holds back the, the electrons of the, of the atom. And so they ionize very quickly. And so this is kind of the parameter regime that we are dealing with. We can also describe it um, differently, and this is what I'm going to, or what I want to, um, to write up. Namely, that we, that we kind of start with the idea that we used in order to introduce nonlinear optics. So remember, we started with linear optics, and we said what the field is doing to, to the electron that orbits um, the nucleus, we said that it wiggles this electron a little bit. So it just disturbs the, the trajectory of the electron a little bit. Right? And because this, in the linear case, this disturbance is so small that the, the restoring force can be treated as with Hooke's law, right? So this would be the first order of the power series expansion. And then when linear optics or nonlinear optics kicks in, then we would say that the dislocation, that the displacement of the electron has become so large that this linear approximation is no longer valid. And if you think back of chapter so and so, where we discovered, uh, where we discussed the the unharmonic oscillator, there we were doing just that, right? And now we are saying um, that we make the field much stronger than that, so strong that it even ionizes. Then we would say that well, that the electron has to oscillate not only a small fraction of the Borean radius, but perhaps more than the Borean radius. Yeah, so this could be, this could be um, an estimate for, um, 
for, for the field strengths or for the conditions that are necessary in order to observe extreme nonlinear optics. So, um, necessary condition for observing extreme nonlinear optics, extreme nonlinear optics. Yeah, so based on our discussion so far, on our, on our previous discussion of nonlinear optics, we need to disturb um, the electron orbit significantly. Say by, by the Borean radius. That is certainly significantly, right? Say by the radius of the orbit. Um, A naught, which equals the 0 0.53 angstroms, as we discussed above, right? Yeah, so now we can estimate um, this, and we do it just by using classical mechanics. So the idea is, forget about this restoring force, forget about the force of the proton, just treat the electron as a free electron, and then we would uh, just discuss which kind of field strength is necessary at which wavelengths in order to produce an oscillation amplitude of one Borean radius, of one atomic unit of, um, of distance. There's a, an estimate based on classical mechanics. Um, by the way, if we if you are confused by using here classical mechanics arguments, think about the following. We use a lot of photons. We produce or we induce perturbations that are, that are large as compared to the usual atomic dimensions at least on the same, you know, on at, at least much larger than, than so far. So uh, now this means that we are kind of approaching the classical limit of quantum mechanics. So it kind of makes sense. So it's kind of a natural thing to do to make a classical mechanics ansatz here. So um, an estimate based on classical mechanics. Uh, what we do is that we just write down um, the equation of motion. So Newton's equation, and the force is, of course, described by, by Coulomb's law. So electric field times the charge. The charge is the, well, is the elementary charge. And the electric field I just write as a monochromatic wave, which you can't do in yeah, so with a monochromatic wave, you can't um, do an experiment um, uh, in order to observe extreme nonlinear effects. You need a, a pulsed field, but actually close to the peak of this field 
or the pulsed field is, well, quasi-monochromatic, right? So, uh, in some sense, uh, this is a usual, uh, this is a, a sensible uh, way to write it down. Okay, well, um, then we can find the amplitude, and the amplitude, which I usually, yeah, let's write it just as A, right? We integrate twice, and what we get is something like this here. Uh, Perhaps I write it like this. Yeah, so without integration constants, I would write it in the following way. We have E times, um, so charge times uh, the electric field of the laser divided by the mass of the electron. We'll soon set it just to one because uh, of atomic units, you know. Right? Then we have omega squared times the cosine of omega t. And, well, you can immediately verify it, um, differentiate twice, and you will see that you get basically, that you get the original form, right? And um, what this means is the follow. So uh, our requirement is now that this, um, that this, uh, so we said that we want to make uh, this larger than, um, the, than the atomic unit. Right, so um, we would say that um, yeah, so that this amplitude, so this here is the amplitude, so we would say that E times E naught divided by M times omega squared should be larger than the atomic unit of length, which is approximately 0 0.53 angstroms. And of course, I would do this now in, in atomic units, right? So for atomic units, I'm afraid I, I missed uh, that over there. Yeah, so writing um, these things in atomic unit, in atomic units, it's very nice that the square of the electric field is just the intensity. Right, so this helps here because um, then I just would write that in atomic units, right, in atomic units, I would write that the square root of the intensity divided by the frequency squared, of course also in atomic units, should be larger or equal to one, to one atomic unit of length. Right, and then we can solve, then we can say, which kind of intensity do I need? Well, the intensity that I need would be larger than omega to the fourth, uh, uh, to the fourth power. And um, yeah, so if I have a, an omega um, of, yeah, so uh, if I have um, h bar omega equals 1.55 eV, then the atomic unit would be 1.55 eV divided by the atomic unit of energy. So the 27.211 eV and this is approximately 0 0.05, I don't remember, three or so, or six, or seven, I don't remember, atomic units, right? And now if you take the fourth power of that, uh, then this gets fairly, fairly small uh, in atomic units, but you have to multiply it with 3.51, times 10 to the 16 watts per square centimeter in order to get it in units, in usual SI units. So what we find is that the intensity should be larger than, um, yeah, than a, a 1.4 times 10 to the 11 watts per square centimeter. Good. 
So that could be one way to look at it. It turns actually out that this estimate of the intensity is a, is a little bit low. The other one could be to look at this regime that I just showed, which, what is called the barrier suppression regime, right, as shown here. Um, what intensity or what electric field strength is necessary in order to push this potential barrier below the ionization, below the energy of the ground state. Right. So the second estimate, or second approach, the barrier suppression in intensity. And, of course, it's easy to calculate that, at least if you do it, um, it one-dimensional. Right? So a one-dimensional, if you take a one-dimensional uh, cut uh, through the pot potential, um, one-dimensional approach, or estimate, I should say, There we would find for the barrier suppression intensity, um, the ionization threshold divided by two, and this to the fourth power. And now, if we take um, the example of hydrogen, there we would have 0 0.5, now divided by two, to the fourth power. And uh, this gives 1.37 times 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter. Right. Well, atoms are three-dimensional. And one can also solve that analytically in, for the three-dimensional case. It is useful to do this in parabolic coordinates. And you can also find a formula there, which is by a factor of four larger than this one here. But this is the right ballpark. Well, now there's a third way to, to look at it. And this would be to, to ask oneself, well, um, the idea is that, as I explained already, that we say that the oscillation of this laser field, that this is small as, that this is slow as compared to, um, uh, to the atom. So maybe I, I do it with, um, with a figure that I prepared. So this one here. So here you see, I hope it displays nicely, so the green color. So you see that we didn't disturb it as much as we did before. And um, you, uh, you see that uh, at a certain instant of the oscillation of the laser field, it will distort the potential in this way. Right? A little bit later, half a period later, it will look like this. Right? But in any case, what you see is, well, here perhaps a little bit uh, difficult to see, so let's draw it a little bit for a little bit stronger field. Then we perhaps would have something like this. Right, and here it goes, goes up like this, right? In any case, what you see is that, well, once again, we assume that this field is quasi-static, yeah? so that the things that go, in, that go on inside the atom, they are much faster than, well, 
then um, tipping this potential curve here back and forth once in, a, in an optical cycle. So what you see is that we can have here um, a tunnel effect. We have a potential barrier here. It's not suppressed yet here because the field strength is too small. But what we can do is um, what we can do is is to calculate the rate, the tunneling rate, right? And for hydrogen, it is possible to um, to do that analytically. You can find it in in Landau Lifshitz in the Landau Lifshitz book on on quantum mechanics. Yeah, but if you look um, for that problem in that book, you find that it's only that it's only a homework problem that's uh, that's uh, posed there. So it won't help you very much. Um, but of course, in a special uh, course on strong field laser physics, one would derive it. So here I give just the the result. So the um, the tunneling rate, how many electrons um, tunnel per second through this barrier? Well, second is probably not a good, um, an, uh, a good time unit. How many electrons tunnel in one atomic time unit? Yeah, so that's a question. How many electrons, or what's the probability that the electron tunnels tunnel in one atomic time unit in 24 utter seconds? Well, the formula is the following. Yeah, so we call this W, and uh, it is four times, two times the ionization threshold, which for hydrogen is one half in atomic units, to the power of five over two divided by the field strengths. But uh, the really important thing comes now, namely the exponential factor. And there we have minus 2 over 3, and then once again, 2 times the ionization threshold, but now to the power of 1.5, and again divided by the electric field strengths. Yeah, so you see, the higher you make the field strengths, the higher the ionization probability, or tunneling rate in this case. And of course, the higher you make the ionization threshold, the more the uh, tunneling rate drops down. And it goes exponentially, yeah, because the second term is the deciding, or the most decisive term. So uh, just an example. In atomic units, it's easy enough. Yeah, so an example. We have EIP is 0 0.5 atomic units. Yeah, so people usually don't write A dot U dot for atomic units. I just do it in order to make, um, to make it clear. And uh, we have an electric field, which is 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter. So you see I switch back and forth between atomic and SI units as I wish. So this is 0 0.05 three, if I remember correctly, atomic units. Right? And if you plug that in, then you would find W is 0 0.011 per femtosecond. So in, when f in one femtosecond, the ionization probability is, is 1%. OK, I'm much slower than I expected, I have to admit. So parameter regime of strong fields. Um, I need to introduce a few more decisive parameters. 
and I'm afraid I can't do more than that. Um, yeah, characteristic parameters. The first one is the ponderal mode of energy. Ha, what a word, yeah, ponderal mode of energy. When I was a student, I tried to look it up uh, in, a, in a dictionary in order to get an idea. Uh, finally, I asked my uncle who, uh, who was proud of his knowledge in, in, in Greek, uh, in ancient Greek, um, but I couldn't get an, an idea. And of course, it turned out that it's a, it's, it's a very simple name for, uh, it's, it's a very uh, sophisticated name sophisticated name for a very simple thing. It just means that we were discussing this already, right? So we said that we have a free electron in an oscillating electric field. Uh, we wrote down the equation of motion already. Right? And now what you could do uh, or what you can calculate is the cycle average kinetic energy. And this is the ponderal motive energy. Nothing more and nothing less. Yeah? So UP, this is the cycle averaged. So here, average over two and a half femtosecond. Yeah? So one optical cycle. The cycle averaged kinetic energy of a free electron in an oscillating electric field. Yeah. And in atomic units, UP is given by just the electric field squared, so which is the intensity, divided by four times omega squared. That's the ponderal motive energy. And it's the natural energy scale in strong field laser physics. Yeah, so very important. UP is the natural energy scale in strong field laser physics, so in extreme nonlinear optics. Good. And then we have the so-called Keltish parameter. Oh, Keltish was a Russian scientist. I had the pleasure to learn him now. Uh, he was a solid state physics, physicist mostly, but in his young years, he invented this Kaltish parameters, uh, uh, this Kaltish parameter. And I guess later he was surprised to, um, to learn that he was famous in another field than solid state laser physics. I remember that he once visited uh, the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics, and my boss at that time, Herbert Walter, who was a big name in laser physics, uh, physics still is a big name in laser physics, um, he asked me to, yeah, to show him my lab, and I did the usual thing, um, presented the poster I had pre uh, uh, prepared, and talked something about the Kaltish parameter. And he looked at, at me, and I was not sure whether he, uh, yeah, so I think he was not sure whether I meant the, sound, the same Kaltish then was standing in front of me. <laughs> so this was kind of, of nice. Um, so the Kaltish parameter is defined as the so-called tunneling time 
And tunneling time is a very problematic concept. Yeah, so the idea is that when this electron uh, tunnels out here, that it spends some time under this tunnel, right? And one can make up some, yeah, some, some ways in order to, to define this tunneling time. So this is this ratio of this tunneling time divided by the optical period. Uh, and now remember, so I said that we consider the things that are going on here as quasi-static. So the electric field changes on a, on a fairly slow time uh, scale as compared to, to the atomic time scale. Right? And in terms of these 24 autoseconds, we are we are certainly uh, uh, we are certainly in, yeah, safe, right? So uh, the atomic time scale is hundred times hundred times slower than the oscillation period of our laser. Um, but actually, the atomic sc uh, time sc uh, scale, these twenty-four attaseconds, is not really the important thing, because yeah, so if we are talking about tunneling. Um, then, yeah, so if we are talking about, yeah, so if we want to use a formula like this, then we should make sure that this shape of this potential doesn't change very much in the time between this electron is still was sitting in the ground state and has tunneled out. Right, so after two and a half femtoseconds, yeah, so this thing here will look like that, right? And we certainly want that this tunneling process has happened before that, right? And therefore, this is actually a good definition. The only disadvantage is that defining the tunneling time is a problematic thing, but one can give um, a, a reasonable estimate. But this is not the point for this lecture. This is the point for a course on strong field laser physics. Here we just write down the formula that one can derive. Namely, the ionization potential divided in atomic units, yeah, divided by two times the ponderomotive energy. Right? And we would speak of the quasi-static regime if the Keltish parameter is much smaller than one. Yeah? So quasi-static. So we refine this concept of quasi-static a little bit. Quasi-static, this means that this cultish parameter, which got the name gamma. Yeah? In the literature, you find it as gamma. Uh, is that gamma is much smaller than one. So let's do an example. And then we stop for today, because there's also teaching evaluation, as far as I know. So um, the ionization threshold, we take again hydrogen, yeah, so 0 0.5. And UP, um, we, use, we use 10 to the 14, right? As an intensity, um, we use 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter. Of course, I have to put this in atomic units. Yeah. Ah, I should have given an example above here. Let's do that first. Yeah, so let's give an example for the thing here above. That makes it easier. So example. We take a titanium sapphire laser, so lambda equals 800 nanometers, which means that H bar is equal 1.55 EV, which is equal to 0 0.057 atomic units. Yeah, so if you divide 1.55 by 27 uh, electron volts, you end up there. 
So and as an intensity, we use something typical. Yeah, so the intensity should still be larger than this barrier suppression intensity. Barrier suppression intensity was, was something like 10 to the 14. In the one-dimensional case, four times, or five times 10 to the 14 in the three-dimensional case. So we use 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter, which is equal to, I wrote it down here somewhere, 2.85 times 10 to the minus 3 atomic units. And then you can immediately calculate UP, and you find 0 0.22 atomic units, which is pretty exactly 6 electron volts. Yeah? At 10 to the 14 watts per uh, square centimeter, we have a ponderomotive energy that's much larger than the photon energy. Yeah? So much larger than h bar omega. And if you go to even longer wavelengths, then remember that this goes with the square of the wavelengths. Yeah? So 1 over omega squared, so it goes with the square of the wavelengths. OK. So uh, we use the same thing here. We use a UP, a ponderomotive energy, of 6 EV. And what we get is a gamma that's, of course, 0 0.5 divided by 2 times 0 0.22. Well, well, it's approximately 1, right? But if you're a good theorist, then one can be large as compared to one, but one can also be small against, uh, as compared to one. So the point here is that it is at least not much larger than one. And therefore, this quasi-static um, idea is certainly not fulfilled precisely. So it's certainly not a perfect perfect approximation. But, well, if you don't have any, uh, anything else, yeah, if you can't do anything else, then you have to go with a poor approximation. And, well, it looks like a poor approximation, but it turns out that it's actually not so bad. OK, that's it for today. And next time, we really come to um, yeah, to explain high harmonic generation. And in particular, this strange kind of spectrum in a little bit, yeah, in a little bit more detail. Thank you for your attention and see you for the last lecture next week. <laughs>